Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning in our ongoing philanthropic freedom series. I'm delighted to welcome my friend Dan Pallotta here to AEI, uh, who's known to a lot of you, and I'll give you his bio background in just a second. Our conversation this morning is called the unlock, as Unlocking the Potential of Nonprofits, and you're going to see exactly what we mean here in a second. Dan Pallotta, for those of you who are here, you're here because uh, you know his work, and, and a lot of people in America do. He's a social entrepreneur. He's started five uh, important social enterprises, uh, a number of innovations in the, in the, the social uh, sector are, are his, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. He's the author of a lot of books. Probably he's best known to the layman these days for one of the single most viewed TED Talks in the history of that series with millions and millions and millions of views, where he talked about how nonprofits tend to be mismanaged through the best of intentions. It's going to occupy some of our, our conversation here today. His books are Uncharitable, How Restraints on Nonprofits Undermine Their Potential, which I recommend to you to your interest if you haven't read it already, and Charity Case, How the Nonprofit Community Can Stand Up for Itself and Really Change the World, uh, which has, in fact, changed the sector to a very large extent. Uh, please well, join me in welcoming Dan Pallotta. Thank you. Good morning, Dan. There. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Nice to see you. I, uh, I've, I got to know you personally a, a few months back, and, and we have a lot in common, and we share a lot of the same values, and I've been looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, welcome to the, the new AEI. This is one of the first events we've held in this new space. Yeah, it's beautiful. You're, you're risk takers with a white floor. Well, it, you know, we really are. And this is, you know, we, we, the big risk that we took is set, having a set in a 1915 Bulls Arts building, and the set looks like the... Like, like the old Mike Douglas show, doesn't it? <coughs> it looks better than that. No, I remember Mike Douglas. It looks better than the better Mike than Douglas that. show. Yeah, That's yeah. the quote of the day, my friends, quote of the day. Um, thank you for joining us here uh, on this series. I've told you a little bit about some of the people we've had through. And uh, you know, we've had people who've invented a lot of stuff, and I actually want to start right on that. And I told you once that I was sitting on a train with a guy, an old man, and I was talking to him. and. I asked him where he was going. It was in Europe. And he said he was going to his castle in Italy. I was like, castle in Italy? What did you do for a living? And he said, well, you know when you walk, he was Dutch. He says, you know when you walk into a phone booth and the phone book is on the swivel? And I said, yeah. And he said, that's mine. <laughs> and, you know, and it occurs to me that all the ubiquitous stuff you see, somebody created it. And you created something in the nonprofit sector that everybody's seen. Um, all of us have participated in, in uh, activities for our favorite charities, walks for AIDS, walks for breast cancer. And, and the, the more adventurous among us have participated in the multi-day versions of these things. And, and that's yours. That's something that you actually made. And it, it revolutionized the way that many nonprofits raised their money. Tell us about the origin of that and how you came up with the idea and, and what it actually did for your organization and for the sector. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think it's, it's interesting. I, I don't think... I think most innovation comes from a place other than a desire to innovate. So it's ironic that we use this word innovation so much. You know, I think I think most innovation comes from a deep frustration with the gap between um, what's possible and what's reality. And and that's where the AIDS rides, which is, is where it started, came from me. You know, I happen to be gay. Uh, in the, in the early 1990s, before these life-saving drugs called protease inhibitors had been developed, a friend would tell you he was HIV positive, and, you know, literally, six weeks later, he'd be dead, and you'd be meeting his parents for the first time at his funeral. And you were going to a lot of funerals, and you were meeting a lot of parents without their 26-year-old sons there to introduce you to them, and there was nothing big you could do about it. You could stick a red ribbon on your jacket. You could go to a Saturday morning balloon-filled fun walk, you know, for, for AIDS. And, and so I, I thought that the AIDS community needed some power, powerful vehicle for the expression of all this loss and all of this grief. And I had done a cross-country bike ride when I was in college. It was very, very powerful for hunger and, and thought, let's do something like that. And so we created this seven-day bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles called California AIDS Ride. You had to go the whole seven days. You had to go the whole 600 miles. You had to sleep in a tent for six nights. You had to raise a minimum of $2,000 in order to do it. So it was a daunting proposition. And we didn't market it to athletes or to cyclists. We marketed it to ordinary people who had it in them to do something extraordinary. 
And then uh, we struck a chord with people. You know, that first AIDS ride was very successful. It netted a little over a million dollars. So we began expanding them all over the United States, then looked at the issue of breast cancer, which had similar dynamics. So we created these long, 60-mile-long breast cancer three-day walks. Then we created a 26-mile walk through the night for suicide prevention here in D.C. because that was an issue that had been very much in the closet. So this idea of the long journey that honors your friends, that honors <clears throat> your potential, that honors your love, that, that was really the innovation. And, and it just came from a deep frustration with the observation or the thought, really, is this all we can do? Blow up balloons and walk five kilometers? Is this it? <laughs> you know, the, the way that you're talking, it sounds an awful lot like the community of Santiago which is a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And there's a yes. long tradition in the Catholic faith and most other religions about pilgrimages. Yes. And the idea of a pilgrimage is a mortification of yourself. Tell me about that. I mean, where did this come from for you as an idea of, of really giving of oneself and not just of one's money? <laughs> Probably having more brawn than brains. <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> you're a really good athlete this, and you're Catholic, you know? so hey. You know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> You know, I, I guess it started for me in college. I got in, I got involved in the Hunger Project. I was I was a, a freshman at Harvard, chairing the Hunger Action Committee. I had grown up in a middle class, you know, working class, blue collar neighborhood. I didn't know from hunger, global hunger, and I was learning that 20 million people die of hunger every year. Most of them children, mostly dying of diarrhea, and and and. We were doing these little fundraisers for Oxfam, these little fasts, right? We'd get students to give up a meal on a particular night, and the university food services would donate two bucks to Oxfam for every student that agreed, student that agreed not to eat. And it wasn't a Gandhi-like fast because everyone just went to Pinocchio's Pizza that night. But you know, we did <laughs> we did raise fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars each time. Gandhi but wasn't I, doing that, by the way. That's no, right. Gandhi yeah, wasn't yeah, doing yeah. that. And there again, I thought. Really, we're, we're, we're at one of the best universities in the country. We're supposed to be the country's future leaders, and this is it. This is all we can muster in the face of those kinds of statistics. Um, and I was riding my bike to the beach one day and heard, coincidentally, about two guys who were bicycling across America for cancer research. And it totally took my breath away, and I said, that's what I want to do. And I want to get a large group of students to bike across America for world hunger. So my co-chair and I... Mark Ticano, actually, who's a congressman now from Riverside County, we went and sat for 13 nights at each of the 13 dining halls at Harvard and asked every student who walked by, we, we bicycle, you know, enthusiastically, we bicycle across America with us next summer to fight world hunger. And everyone said no, <laughs> except for 38 other people. And so that next summer, 39 of us flew to Seattle and rode our bikes 4,200 miles across the country. And it was a grueling experience. It was a hot summer. You know, we had two U-Haul trucks that sometimes were with us and sometimes not. And we didn't have water stops or water stations. And, you know, there were, there were a lot of moments when I just wanted to quit. I thought, this is a really bad idea. I don't know why I thought of this. This is, we should just pack it up and go home. And, you know, you just keep, you just keep pushing through that and pushing through that. And, and you find something else in yourself. And, 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 and I thought, People need that kind of experience on a, on a, on a larger scale, or, 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 mm. or we need to create that kind of experience at scale for people. Mm. And that's what the AIDS Rides and Breast Cancer Three Days did. And you had the most beautiful stories on those events. You know, a 70-year-old woman who's terrified of riding her bike from San Francisco to Los Angeles, but her son has just revealed to her that she's HIV positive and she's going to do it, damn it, and there's nothing that's going to stop her. My mom's a breast cancer survivor. She and my two sisters walked in the, in the Boston breast cancer three days, 60 miles. And, you know, she struggled. She struggled through that. And, and uh, my dad and I rode across Montana in the AIDS vaccine ride when he was 65, you know. And, um, you know, just watching him struggle to cross the Continental Divide mm. and, and watch him. Uh, find something in himself that he had never seen before. Seeing my grandmother at the breast cancer three day come up to my uh, mother and say, Patsy, I'm so proud of you. And my mother saying it's the first time she ever said that to me. Mm. Mm. That's what it was about. You know, it was, it was about, about much more than the money. Hmm. You know, there's obviously a deep spiritual component to this, the idea of giving of oneself in service of others. And, and, 
isn't this the best that we can find in the nonprofit sector, is finding the deep sort of spiritual roots of what we're trying to do for the dignity of others, for the potential of others, and doing it in such a way that we can give of ourselves fully. The spiritual element is the most interesting, but there's another part that actually has some technical backing to it. You know, one of the things that we've found, those of us who did research in the nonprofit sector over the past 15 years, there was a view from economists going back a long, long time that, that money and time are substitutes for each other, right? Mm -hmm. You discovered that's wrong. I mean, I, I, I learned it in the data, <laughs> but you discovered it in real time when you were in college, that in point of fact, that money and time are, are complements to each other, that we want to give of ourselves fully, and the, the more fully that we can do that for the, the, the spiritual element that you're talking about here, uh, this is really one of the secrets to success for nonprofits. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's, it's one of the things I preach a lot is, you know, people are, are hungry to do the most that they can possibly do on behalf of the causes they care about deeply. People are, are tired of being asked to do the least they can possibly do, yet, we, yet that's what we consistently, out of fear, do. Like, let's make it easier for people, let's make it easier for people, you know, let's make it easier. Like, when, uh, when others took over the breast cancer three days, they started to say, well, let's make it two days. You know, right. <laughs> and then one than the, 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 the yeah. logical place to go from there is, well, let's make it one. You yeah, know? that's and right. You're right back where you started, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. And <clears throat> one of the things that, one of the big mistakes that nonprofits have made is uh, is trying to make it as absolutely easy to give. And the, the canonical example of that is saying, let's just do, what we're the United Ways, for example, have said, I'm just going to do paycheck deduction. Right. So you're not even going to know that it's going out of your account. That's a huge mistake. You want people to write checks. And you want people to show up, and you want people to, for, for goodness sake, you want people to get on their bikes. And, and another thing, you know, that, that we did, I had grown up in my early 20s doing major gift fundraising for the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel and, and uh, was taught about the value of personal relationship in, in giving. So when we, when we started the AIDS rides, it was before the Internet, right? So we told people, look, don't just ask people for $10, $15. Send your friends a letter hold a house party, and we hosted thousands of house parties, take them out to lunch and look them in the eye and say, I'm, I'm doing this and this is why I'm doing it, will you give me $1,000? And sit with the uncomfortability of that, mm. of actually asking somebody to do that. We've, we've, the internet has really helped to strip that human element out of things, you know, it's like send as many emails to your friends as you can and get them to click and get them to donate. and. I, th I think that that's valuable in many ways, but we're losing the we're losing the human component of philanthropy. Philanthropy means love of humanity, and I think humanity has to be a part of the chemistry for it to work at its best. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so that's really the first thing that people who know about your work know about is this incredible innovation. The second thing that people who followed your work are going to know is this phenomenally successful TED Talk. I mean, weirdly successful TED Talk. I mean, I'm super into it because I'm a philanthropy guy, but you never think that you're going to get up in front of a, you know, a TED audience and give a talk about, about how the, the, the structure of the nonprofit sector, then four million people are going to watch it. So and I'm not going to tell people what it's about. I want you to tell people that one of the top um, viewed TED Talks, what was it about? It was about, uh, it's, it's not about how nonprofits are mismanaged. It's about the dysfunctional way we've been taught to think about charities that forces them into a kind of behavior in the interest of pleasing the culture, in the interest of pleasing the public, and out of fear that if they don't, that'll be the end of them, that really destroys their true potential. Ultimately, what it's about is, is it about, it's about dreams and it's about the potential of the nonprofit sector. I think the nonprofit sector has the potential to eradicate many of the large scale social problems we confront, but not if it's constrained in the way that it currently is. You know, we, whatever obstructions there are, whatever regulations there are in the for profit sector that, that hamper dreams. Some dreams get through, you know. Walt Disney did build Disney World, and Elon Musk did build the Tesla, and Steve Jobs did build Apple, and Oprah Winfrey did build her company. You, you see people dreaming of the impossible in the for profit sector, but I think the nonprofit sector often finds it impossible to dream. 
And the reason is dreaming is a liability in the nonprofit sector. Something could go wrong. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong with donor dollars. Now, if something goes wrong with Tesla, it goes wrong with investor money, it's a business issue. Something goes wrong in, with Oxfam America or some nonprofit organization, it's with donor money. And then it has moral and ethical implications. And no moral or ethical person wants to step into that territory. And so that's why I think you see poverty stuck at 14%, now about 13.5% of the population ever since the 1970s. The adult illiteracy rate stuck at 14% of the U.S. population for the last 25 years. Suicide up 35% in the United States in the last 15 years. Breast cancer deaths 43,000 25 years ago, 40,000 this year. I think a critical piece of the problem is scale. The social problems are massive. Our nonprofit organizations, even the big ones, are tiny up against the scale of these massive social problems. And we have this belief system that, with the best of intention, keeps our nonprofit organizations tiny. And Ted, I said we have two rule books. We have one for the nonprofit sector, one for the for profit sector. And this nonprofit sector rule book discriminates against the sector in a bunch of different areas in the area of compensation. You know, you want to make $50 million selling violent video games to kids? Go for it. We'll put you on the cover of Fortune magazine. You want to make half a million dollars trying to end poverty in Washington, D.C.? You're, you're a parasite. And we think of this as our code of ethics without realizing that that code sends an enormous number of people who can make a huge difference in the nonprofit sector marching into the for-profit sector every year. Advertising and marketing, and this is, a, this is a big one, you know. We tell Budweiser, you go spend, spend, spend to your heart's delight on advertising to bring in new customers until the last dollar no longer produces a penny of value. But we don't want nonprofits to spend money on advertising. Well, what does that mean? It means the for-profit sector has this outsized megaphone uh, uh, on talking to the public about all the good that its products do, and the nonprofit sector can't talk about all the good that its work does. So if I told the movie industry, you can advertise, and I told the music industry, you cannot, people are going to buy a lot more movies than they are music, right? Because they just don't know about the music. And that's what's, that's what's going on with respect to Budweiser versus Oxfam. Risk, you know, Disney can make a $200 million movie that flops and it doesn't occur to anyone to call the attorney general on the way out of the movie theater, but you do a little $2 million community fundraiser for the poor and it isn't an out-of-the-park home run the first year and your character's called into question. And then there's no capital market. There is no massive amounts of capital, you know, multi-trillion dollar capital market for ideas like Uber and Tesla and Airbnb and Facebook and you name it. But you've got a fundraising idea like the AIDS rides or the breast cancer three day, there's no systematic capital market. There's no VC market you can take that to. So you put those things together. You can't pay talent to, to, to lure it away from the for-profit sector. You can't advertise to try and increase donations and build market demand. You can't take risks and you don't have a capital market. You've just put the nonprofit sector at a huge disadvantage to the rest of the economy. Hmm. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's hope for America when that speech has as many v views as a, you know, a cat video. So uh, it doesn't yet. <coughs> well, I mean, it's it's, it's competitive. The cats are winning. It's con competitive with a cat video, at least. You know, not there's nothing wrong with not that there's anything wrong with cats. Don't get me wrong. Um, go by the way, if you haven't seen that video, go watch it. Go watch that TED talk, Dan's first TED talk. We're going to talk about a second TED talk here in a second. But I have to say that you know, your the rhetorical style is brilliant in that TED talk too. I mean, I, I study a lot how people do public speaking because that's a lot of what I do for a living. And you know, you got to hook people in by showing them. You got 14 minutes on this thing that you're I, different. I had 18. Yeah, they only 18. gave you 14. See, They've cut it's, down. It's, like, on you know, it's just you know, this is, made all the difference. It's like you know, this is what it's like to be a conservative in public life. There's nothing more than discrimination. <laughs> on, so, um, <coughs> so <laughs> I'm a victim. I just want to, for the record, the uh, the. It's interesting. So you, you you distinguish yourself as somebody who's different, such that people will start to listen. And the way that you did it was brilliant. I mean, you come out. And uh, and your first slides like your first I you know I I'm a gay man click and here are my my triplets 
right? And so you've just discombobulated everybody's concept of Van Palata, right? And everybody's ready to listen at that point. I have to say, I compliment you on your style. Oh, no, I, I said I'm going to talk about social innovation. Yeah, yeah. I'm gay and I have triplets. Who do you know that's done anything more innovative than that? <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> Um, so, so talking about how the nonprofit, is, uh, nonprofit sector is structured, and the fact that it's that we have di an entirely different set of entrepreneurial standards for the for-profit nonprofit sector, and by the way, it's even worse in the public sector. I mean, you lose one dollar, and it's waste, fraud, and abuse in in the in the in the public sector, which is one of the reasons that it's utterly risk averse, and it's the reason it's just sprawling and mediocre is because there's every incentive to make sure that no risk is ever taken. And a risk-free environment is a mediocre environment, almost by axiom, right? And, and it's terrifying. You know, you, you think about our Elon Musk and, uh, you know, the battery fails on the yeah. Tesla. Okay, the investors are going to beat him up. But you do some, some new community fundraising endeavor, something you had a dream about, you wanted to try it, you wanted to see if it could work, and it doesn't work and donor money was put at risk to try and see if it could work, you know, you, then you've taken the facing the prospect that the attorney general's gonna call you, and it's, it's terrifying. So you just don't wanna go there, you know. Uh, yeah. risk, risk has peril in the nonprofit yeah. sector that, that, that doesn't even come close to in the for-profit sector. It's interesting, and when it comes to salaries, you've talked about this too, where you know, nothing is worse than a, a New York Times story about the high salary of a nonprofit executive, which still is a fraction of what the person of, of more or less equal responsibility would be in the for-profit sector, where a story on that would be adulation or, or ignoring it at best. Yeah, well, you know, critics say to me, well, look, you say that we should pay people based on the value they produce in the nonprofit sector, and that could mean they make a, an enormous amount of money. And that's just wrong. What you're missing is the enormous good feeling, the enormous psychic benefit that comes from being able to help other people. And it's that psychic benefit that draws people in to the nonprofit sector. It's that psychic benefit that gives the nonprofit sector a competitive advantage over the for profit sector at attracting the best people. It doesn't say anything about what's going to keep the best people, but at attracting the best people. And if you want to say it's the psychic benefit, that really gives the nonprofit sector an advantage. You're saying there's no psychic benefit in the for-profit sector. People who work at Apple go to work miserable every day. You know, no sense that the iPad is having any impact on education or that the iPhone is making any difference in the lives of the blind. You know, my kids are eight years old. The difference Legos has made in their life. People at Lego, no sense that they're doing anything to help kids with their motor skills and their imaginations and their building skills. Starbucks, no sense that they're doing anything to help coffee farmers in the developing world. Whole Foods, you name it. If you think about it objectively, there are just all kinds of places that bright young people can go and have a tremendous experience that they're making a difference in the world, that they're contributing and get stock options as well, leaving the nonprofit sector increasingly with very little in the way of competitive advantage for attracting and keeping those people. Hmm. There, uh, th there's a large psychological literature uh, about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation that, of course, you're aware of. And there, there, there's studies by social psychologists that do experiments in which they'll, for example, they'll, they'll have a bunch of college students in the experiment. You always do these experiments on undergraduate students at universities because they'll, you know, they'll, you know, they'll do anything if you can get it past the internal review board. And, uh, and <clears throat> you know, electric shocks, you know, leaving them in a room with a monkey for three days, whatever. And, but you know, the, in these particular experiments, they ask them to solve these little puzzles, you know, put the, to take apart these two metal things. And it's really interesting and fun. And then you offer to pay them to do it, and they want to do it less. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we cope with that? I mean, I understand that we have to compensate people such that we can take the game to the for-profit sector and get the most innovative, risk-taking, interesting ingenious minds into it, but what about the extrinsic motivation issue? You know, I showed a slide at the TED Talk where I, 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 that uh, the median compensation for a Stanford MBA was $400,000 at the age of 38, and the average salary for the CEO of a $5 million plus medical charity in the U.S. was, uh, excuse me, hunger charity was $84,000. There's no way you're going to get that person earning 400 grand to go take the job as the head of the hunger charity for 84,000. And people say, well, that's just because that person's greedy. Not necessarily. It's cheaper for that person to donate $100,000 every single year to the hunger charity. 
So feel like they're covering, doing the job of the CEO of the hunger charity. Now be called a philanthropist, mm -hmm. right? Because they just donated $100,000 to charity. Probably supervised the poor SOB who decided to take the job of, as the CEO of the hunger charity mm -hmm. and have a lifetime of this kind of earning potential and popular praise still ahead of them. So, you know, you had Bill Gates up here. P people want to say, you know, money... Uh, Money is, is, is greed and that's it. That, uh, the, the, there's no more complexity to it. Well, if you really wanted to change the world, wouldn't you want power? Hmm. Wouldn't you want a lot of power? Yeah, right. You know, and isn't that what Bill Gates has now? He has a lot of, he gets to say yeah. what every AIDS and hunger organization is gonna do with their money. So it's not necessarily true that the desire for money is mutually exclusive from the desire to make a difference in the world. In some cases, they're, they're one and the same. I mean, some, some people say, I really want to make a difference in the world, and the best way to do that is for me to go out and make a lot of money, secure my family, everything else, and then dedicate the rest of my life to, to philanthropy. Hmm. That's, a, I think, a very powerful point um, that we need to take account of, that you can, as a philanthropist, do as much or more uh, to cover what you would have earned in the nonprofit sector. And, and as opposed to sacrificing your entire earning capacity uh, to the nonprofit sector itself. Yeah, and, and some people say, well, you know, people who want to make a lot of money, don't, they just don't belong in the nonprofit sector. Does that include all of the major donors who decided to go out and make a lot of money who are making your work possible? Does it include them, yeah, uh, right. you know? Yeah, right. Uh, you have a sympathetic audience to this point of view at AEI uh, <coughs> because we believe in capitalism being paid their, 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 their worth to the extent that we can. But it's all in the interest of do we actually want to get these problems solved? You know, right. when we look at the Boston Red Sox, we say go find the best pitcher. I don't care how much it costs. I just want them to win. Why don't we have that attitude with respect to the Who cares what we're paying the person if the problem is actually getting solved, right? right. You know, I mean, the the, the uh, head of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America was forced to resign when CNN revealed that she was making $800,000 one year. Never was reported that she tripled network-wide revenues from half a billion dollars to $1.5 billion, and she doubled the number of kids served. So what if you could have gotten a, a CEO for $200,000? but she kept revenue stable at half a billion dollars. So you saved $600,000 in salary, you lost a billion dollars in revenue. How does this make sense on any planet? Indeed. Now, um, what I admire about you, among other things, is that we've gone in just the past 25 minutes from the, the transcendental to the profoundly practical. <laughs> um, and that's how your mind works, as I've gotten to know you. And so I wanna take you back to the transcendental because you just did another TED Talk that has been viewed, you know, twice as much as mine. I think. Um, <laughs> once again, it's discrimination. The, um, what do you mean? I mean, I'm gay. You're you're you can, head of the American Enterprise. There's it's a wash. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good point. I bet we could actually quantitatively figure that yeah. one out. I'm Italian. There's a little bit of discrimination going on there. I'm overhead. Like I, you know, there's I there's. I, I'm pure overhead too, pure American overhead Enterprise too, Institute. So, so um, the let's go back to your your latest TED talk, which takes on these these not not so earthbound themes that mm -hmm. gets back into the whole mm -hmm. theme of human flourishing, which I know is sitting on your genome. Mm -hmm. Tell me tell me about your latest TED talk. Give it to me in, in three to four minutes instead of the eighteen they they give uh, twelve. They just gave me they gave for you that 12. one. It was broadcast live. To they they had a very tight timeline. Yeah, tell me about it. I love it. I think they will too here. Well, it 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 was about the idea that we when when we do dream it's in the arena of our doing right that we have wonderful dreams about colonizing mars we have wonderful dreams about wireless charging of iphones we have you know jeff bezos is sending people into space elon musk wants to uh, you know, solar power, everything. We have all of these wonderful dreams in the arena of our doing, but we don't have dreams in the arena of our being. Like we set the bar no higher than stability in our emotional lives. Um, we, and, and, and what I'm interested in is well, how far could we take our emotional lives? We, we accept uh, poverty when it comes to our emotional lives. Even even the boldest, bravest dreamers among us can can dream of 
<clears throat> taking rockets to Mars, but I can't figure out my marriage, you know, so I'm just going to focus on Mars, right? Um, and what is, the, what is our capacity to dream in the domain of our being? How, how audacious could our authenticity become? Um, how powerful could our presence become? How radical could our forgiveness and, and compassion become? Um, and why don't we begin to get <clears throat> scientific about those things? Why don't we get as scientific about those things as we are about technology? You know, in many ways, as wonderful as the iPhone is what it re and the Internet is, what they really have allowed us to do is communicate irresponsibly faster, right? Is to be <clears throat> jerks to one another quicker. <clears throat> Um, and so, and so, so what I'm really interested in is, and, and it's where, despite the fact that I'm passionate about changing the way our culture thinks about charity so that charity can be unleashed to change the world, I think even if it does change the world in that respect, it won't ultimately impact our fundamental happiness because our fundamental happiness has much more to do with who we are being in this moment right now today in this room. You know, one of the things that we've observed here at AEI is that when, when, we, when we talk to innovators, uh, innovators who have a strong social conscience, ordinarily they fall into one of two camps. And you and I have talked about this before. You have people who are really concentrated fundamentally on human dignity and those who are really concentrated on human potential. I mean, we all care about both. But, you know, you're in the second camp of human potential. And the reason this whole thing you're talking about now, and, and again, go watch the second TED Talk if you want more and understand what Dan is talking about here. The reason that that's a, such an important mindset in the way of thinking about human potential, in my view, and, and I want to see if you think I'm right about this, is that we have uh, treated scientifically and systematically the idea of scientific and technological potential in a systematic way, the way that you would if you want to make real advances. The, when um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was started because two guys in their dorm room at Caltech were experimenting with fuel and rockets and started a fire. And the dean, instead of kicking them out, he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set up a laboratory. I'm going to buy a little farmhouse, and you guys are going to start a laboratory. And the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was, was started all based on experimentation about the idea of how technology can change the world. And in point of fact, something touches us every single day that has come out of JPL, come out of that mindset. Yet if you want to, if you want to improve your marriage, if you want to become a better worker, if you want to think about how you can use your time better, you wander over to Barnes & Noble in the self-improvement section and buy you know, a 1960 book called The Science of Psycho-Cybernetics or you know, something written by somebody who may or may not be qualified to give you advice. Right. Is, so the point is, why don't we, is it, is, it, is it your view that we need to have a human potential laboratory movement? Absolutely. I think we need to get as scientific about and as curious about human potential and human being as we have been about technology. <clears throat> and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not the first to think of it in this way. Uh, I've got inspired by reading about Jonas Salk's idea of an epic B, <clears throat> letter B, you know, that, that in <clears throat> epic A it was all about uh, quantity, that resources were unlimited, and that in epic B we would realize that resources were more limited and that it would become about the quality of human existence, and um, you know he wrote about it crudely as the you know the human mind, um, but but I, I I think that's where I don't I don't think humanity's future is on Mars. Um, I think humanity's future is being able to be present right here right now. Um, it's in this idea of an epic B that I've sort of relabeled B E. <laughs> mm. um, you know, it's in this ability to be. We we have we have no facility with presence. And other than Eckhart Tolle, you know, on our iPods once in a while, we don't have any systematic way of advancing that as a science. You know, if you look at, at, at communication, we've put all of, the, all of the research into the technology and no research into how do human beings actually understand one another. We're no better at it now than we were 250 years ago. Hmm. Yet look at yet let, look look at where the technology has gone, right? Hmm. And you know, many people who've talked about human flourishing and happiness have observed that, that getting to Mars and getting a better iPhone and more apps 
that's at most the extrinsic margin of happiness. That's four or five percent of the life and life. And we're not working on the 95 or 96 percent of the life and life that's really harder to cope with. We're, we're using the same philosophy and technology that people were working on thousands of years ago, perhaps. And that's what you want to dig into, right? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so on, in, in that way, I'm gonna, this leads me to my last question before we turn it over to our friends in the audience. So start getting your questions ready for Dan. I know you've got some. While I ask my last question, which is this. You're a human potential guy. Um, you believe the world could be better. If you didn't believe the world could be better, you wouldn't have dedicated your life to social enterprise, starting off with trying to deal with the East African famine and then doing AIDS rides and, and, then, and now talking about human potential. Amazing. So let's think, it's 2016, and in 10 years, in 2026, uh, the world is better. It's better. Um, and we all have our criteria what it would mean. Those of us who are sitting in this room, it's not just everybody's richer. It's actually better. It's qualitatively better. What does that mean to Dan Pallotta, and what did we do to get there? You know, you and, I, you and I talked about this a little earlier, and you and you said that it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to love, and and I would agree with you that it comes down to love, and and you know where you're marginalized for talking about love, right? Love isn't sophisticated. Love is silly. Love is, love is sophomoric, but really, love is the most sophisticated thing known known to humanity. For me, I think I think the the starting place for that is presence. And it's a, it's a movement to create presence. On the AIDS rides and the breast cancer three days, we had this counterintuitive approach that was controversial with our charities. Is we, we wanted the events to be about human kindness, that, we, that people were already doing a lot for AIDS and breast cancer on the events. The context while you were on the event was gonna be human kindness um, and seeing how rigorously you could take that. You know, you see someone having trouble setting up their tent, go help them even though you know the dinner line's gonna get longer. And this, in, these incredible communities of kindness developed. I mean, a hundred things during the day that would make you want to cry. And so in, in, in my next venture, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna build a series of events that, that focus exclusively on that, you know, on kindness, and on and on presence because we're not we're not present to one another right uh, uh, how are you I'm great R really is that really what's going on you're really great meanwhile you know you're you think you look horrible today you think you're stupid you're going into something that really intimidates you where you think someone else is better than you your mother's sick you're having a lot of trouble in your marriage there's a, there's, a, there's a whole layer of reality that's going on in our lives that we never talk about, that we just mask and we mask and we get better and better and better at masking it. And anyone that thinks that that is not the root of all the problems in the world is living in a fool's paradise. Mm -hmm. You know, you can change all, you can change political parties and power structures and all that stuff. And if you don't deal with that, that, that we're human beings being inhuman to one another, that we are not present to one another in the moment, forget about it. So I, I know I said that was my last question, but this is my real last question. <laughs> so tell me more about that initiative to get us to that place. Because I know it's still in Kuwait for you, and, and it's in the early stages. So, so tell me more about what we're going to see. Yeah, to get us there. It, it, it's called it's called Epic B B E, and and it, it will be something where we introduce a curriculum <coughs> about about being and about responsibility because uh, you know we get too hallmarky about love and compassion that it's all feel good. Love and compassion isn't all feel good, right? Sometimes it's really uncomfortable. It's about taking responsibility for the judgment you just made about against someone without knowing a damn thing about them. And it's about you looking deeply into yourself and how often you do that and why you do that and why you avoid your life. So it's not all just be nice to other people, you know? It's much, it's much more difficult and challenging and sophist more sophisticated than that, and that's why I think the reward is huge. So we're, we're, we're developing a curriculum that will take place in, in hotel ballrooms, that, but will also take place on cause-related events where, where that will be primary, and, and the cause-related stuff is part of it, but, but it's, 
It's teaching people how to be and how to be present and how to be responsible and how to be human with one another. That's what I think we need a movement for. And we want to make that kind of experience as ubiquitous in the culture as going to Disneyland. Hmm. Love is not for sissies, indeed. And, uh, and we need, a lot of people need help with it. Now we're going to turn over to our friends in the audience. So we'll start right back here. And uh, house rules, wait for the mic. Uh, stand up if you can, tell us who you are. And if you've got a protest statement, put it in the form of a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Bernardo Rico, no, no, pro, no protest statement, just uh, lots of questions. Thank you, for, thank you both of you for a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, I'm reminded just quickly of, uh, I think Jean Case was here about, or in the old building about a year and a half ago, and she mentioned something about you know, not waiting until you're, you've made all the money to kind of be a benefactor and, and contribute. <laughs> a way of uh, you know being um, playing a role in nonprofits, and I'm going back to this idea of this mutual exclusivity between kind of either working for the private sector, working maybe even in the public sector, and then working for the nonprofit sector. And as someone who has an idea, I'm, and I'm cultivating a nonprofit on the side, and one of the frustrating things I find is that I you know you, it's really hard for people to kind of do that, um, make that living for yourself and for your family as well as actually you know, launching an idea and actually making and bringing it to fruition. Is there any thought about at private companies, and I'm sure there are some of them, or even the public sector, where people are allowed to, on the side, cultivate their nonprofit, <coughs> nonprofits or ideas? And I just go and think of Google. I don't know if they do this anymore, but in terms of innovation, they used to be allowed to do one day, um, or to get one day of something of you know, their own kind of liking. So I, I think one of the kind of things to like break the barrier in the beginning is like really practical things because it shouldn't be as mutual exclusive as either going out and working for $100,000 in the nonprofit sector or you know, half a million in the private sector. Yeah, I agree, but I, I don't think the solution for that is uh, go to work in the for-profit sector and we'll give you a few crumbs to go uh, check out your, your, your nonprofit y kinds of things. I think there has to be an equality that if you produce value in the, in the nonprofit sector, you should be allowed to make as much money based on the value you produce. And, and that's very important as you do in the for profit sector. You know, I show a slide in my talks. Some people say, well, you just you can't make a lot of money in the nonprofit sector, it's an IRS thing. Well, that's not true. The head football coach at the nonprofit University of Alabama last year made $7.8 million in a nonprofit setting. Each of the 20 highest paid college football coaches at nonprofit, tax exempt, government supported universities in the United States last year made at least $3.2 million. Each of the 10 highest paid college football coaches made at least $4 million in a setting where some kids can't afford to go to college. And people say, well, that's just we, what we pay college football coaches because we pay them on the basis of the value they produce, you know, the ticket, ticket revenue. <clears throat> well, if we can pay college football coaches on the basis of the value they produce in a nonprofit setting, surely we can pay the people trying to cure cancer and end hunger in the nonprofit sector on the basis of the value they produce. And it shouldn't have to be a choice where I come work for your for-profit and through your grace you give me 15 percent of my time to go work on my compassion. I should be able to work full-time on my compassion and get paid the same amount for the value that I produce as I do producing some for-profit consumer product. Hmm. <clears throat> Next. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Warner. I work at the Atlas Network. Um, You've already broken the rules. I said, please stand up. I'm kidding. Oh, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's funny. I was like, what are the things I'm supposed to say? Yeah, we're, okay. the, uh, we're very authoritarian. It's a very rules-based approach. No, I'm in, uh, okay. Well, I have the potential to ask a great question. All right. Fantastic. Um, no, we're, uh, we're doing some peer-to-peer -peer training for board members coming up across lots of different nonprofits. What conventional wisdom do we have in boards that needs to change? in terms of uh, how we talk about or train or orient board members? Yeah, well, we That's don't. That's really important, by the way. The reason I thank you, Matt, is because they, boards really make all the difference, don't they? I mean, they're, they're the ones who are making the salary decisions. They're the, they're the adult supervision in the C3 sector. Yes. And so making them think differently is really the first step to getting where we need to go, according to your view, right? It is, yeah. absolutely. And we've, we're just launching something in Boston on November 12th called the Boulder Board Training to teach board members um, how, to, how to behave more boldly. I think two things. Ultimately, 
you know, the board members get trained on this curriculum that, look, your role is fiduciary, it's financial, it's fiscal, it's leadership. Your role is to make sure that uh, the organization doesn't run out of cash and that it doesn't uh, do anything wrong. And I think that's a fundamental missed opportunity. I think the role of a board is to work with the CEO to create a possibility, to create a great possibility for impact, come up with a plan for making that possibility real, and come up with a plan for funding um, that possibility. You know, board members, interestingly, they, they, if they're from the business world, they do a number of things to make themselves successful in business. They hire great people and they incentivize them with money to keep them and to get them to produce more. They advertise and they market. They take risks and they use capital to build things, right? They come into the nonprofit boardroom and they say, okay, we're going to start paying people less money. We're not going to spend any money on advertising. Let's not take any risk because that might jeopardize our programs and there's no capital to work with. Because we've all been raised on this religion that's completely false, that the way to great impact is to minimize overhead um, and, and to minimize salaries. And that's simply not true, and more and more people are beginning to realize that. You know, the, D Darren Walker, the head of the Ford Foundation, issued a beautiful statement earlier this year in which he said, um, you know, we've been using overhead to measure impact when in fact the opposite may be true. And at Ford, we have been willing participants in this charade. And frankly, we've known it. Um, it was a very courageous statement on his part. Three of the big watchdog agencies after my TED talk issued a joint press release in which they said charities don't need low overhead, they need high performance. And I think boards need that training, that no, your, your, your job is not to reduce overhead. Your job is to make the greatest possible impact that you can in your community. And to do that, you have to dream. You and your CEO have to dream together. You have to dream bigger than you've ever dreamt before. Well, and the, the, many of the foundations that, that fund charities, they have explicit rules about overhead. You know, we pay 10% overhead maximum. Some say we pay 0% overhead as if this would pay for itself. Right. Ford just said they're going to double their overhead from 10 percent to 20 percent. I wish still too low. Still too low. I yeah. wish Darren had said, you know, we're not going to pay attention to overhead at all. We're going to pay attention to uh, impact. You know, if you look at like uh, Leslie Crutchfield's book, The uh, Forces for Good, they studied 12 extremely high impact nonprofits, and and more than half of them only had two stars with the rating agencies. Right. You know. So if you were looking on the basis of who has the lowest overhead, you would be foregoing impact. Mm. Those of you who are from the foundation community, um, it's time, time to step up with courage to uh, pay very high overhead rates to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, right, right here. <coughs> want to break the rules. Hi, I'm Manus Cooney. Um, I'm here in my capacity as chairman of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Mm. Uh, so I chair that board. And we've grappled with some of the overhead issues that you just um, uh, what you've been discussing. Let me just uh, uh, throw out a, a, a question that uh, I think is more practical in this, in this you know, political world in which we navigate, where yeah. everything is uh, being put on you know, the internet and what have you. Um, and that is, we would all agree that there's a tremendous amount of uh, distance between most Americans um, wage earning Americans, hardworking Americans, those trying to uh, you know live a life of dignity and, and achieve things, and what we're paying our our executives at many of our corporations and our and our business leaders, uh, many of them have produced, they haven't produced a company, they're walking into a company, and they're making tens of millions of dollars, and so how in that environment is it possible for an organization, a nonprofit, to step into that and say? That's a, you know, we're going to be more like this part of the, forgive me, the, the, um, the, the elite yeah. world um, and less in touch and less part of the uh, working, working Joe, working class Joe world. I think that's a challenge that many nonprofits face. Yeah. The second thing is, and I would ask is, is that um, in th knowing that, um, you know, there, what is your view on, and this is more, um, uh, a, uh, you know, this is more of a long-term uh, policy issue, but where are you on uh, tax deductibility of donations? Because in the end, many, most all organizations in the nonprofit space view the ability to raise capital through charitable deductions, char charitable donations that are tax deductible as critical. And so long as Congress determines 
you know, what the level of that deduction will be, it's very difficult for those same charities like Roxanne Spillett at Boys and Girls Clubs of America to justify going to Congress and standing in front of Congress and saying, we're going to pay our executives what we, what a Fortune 500 might pay its CEO. Thank you. Well, okay, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. First of all, so Senator Chuck Grassley um, said we're inquiring into the salary of the head of the Boys and Girls Clubs because they get public money. They get something like $40 million a, a year. Well, the head of uh, Lockheed Martin, who makes uh, $13 million a year, they get 95% of their something like $40 billion in annual revenues from the government. And Senator Grassley wasn't doing any inquiry into that. So there's an extreme double standard, even when it comes to public money. But on this issue, you know, some people have said, critics have said poetically, Dan Pallotta is um, putting a knife in the heart of civil society, right? We don't want to see our nonprofits start emulating the compensation practices of for-profit companies. Well, we have a long, long way to go before we've got to worry about anything like that. If you look at what the five highest paid executives in health charities in America are making, uh, muscular dystrophy, Susan Komen, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, American Cancer Society, the five highest paid on an annual basis is $3.2 million. The five highest paid executives in private health insurance, <coughs> right, so we're still talking about little kids with leukemia, $75 million. You look at that graph, it's like this for the insurance companies, this for the leaders of charity. So we've got, we've got a long way to go before, we, if I double the charity salaries, triple the charity salaries, you won't even see a blip in that graph. And I also want to be clear that I'm not some guy out there saying, I just want people to make more money in charity and, and they'll get smarter and they'll get more productive, you know? I don't want to see people making more money for the sake of more money. The only reason I even say it is, let's solve these problems. It's that same frustration that I had in college of why are we only doing these little fasts? When 20 million people are dying of poverty, let's do something big. Why are we giving the for-profit sector every advantage when it comes to compensation and, and handcuffing the nonprofit sector? Why are we doing that? It's absolutely, that, that double standard is ridiculous. Stop treating money like it is a sin in the nonprofit sector. Stop treating it so childishly. So that's really where I'm coming from, just a, just a frustration at the fact that these problems continue to persist. We're not doing anything differently, and we somehow expect that the problems are going to solve themselves. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> right back here. Hi, I'm Mark Gunther. I'm a reporter who writes about philanthropy. Um, I think one reason why, despite your work and despite the regulators or the charity regulators, um, statement that overhead is a myth. The reason why that hasn't spread more widely, I think, is because we don't really have other ways to measure the impact of charities. Right. If we knew which charities were making a difference, which were high performance and which weren't, we could steer our giving based on that rather than these false metrics of overhead. So what progress do you see in that direction? Hmm. Yeah. Knowing the difference between a good charity and a mediocre charity. It's a great question. And, and some people will say, well, look, we have to measure overhead. Even though it's a bad measure, we have to measure it because it's the only thing we can measure. Well, that's like saying, you know, I'm going to take my kid's temperature with a broken thermometer because it's the only thermometer I have in the house, right? It just it doesn't make any sense. We have to ask three questions of, an, of, of charities. What progress are you making? Excuse me, what are, you, what are your goals? What progress are you making toward those goals, and how do you know? Those are the three big questions that need to be asked. And we need some agency for the distribution of that information on a massive scale in a user-friendly, iTunes-like way to every American who wants to donate. We don't have anything remotely like that right now. What we have are Charity Navigator, Charity Watch, the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance. Look, these are all well-intended organizations. Unfortunately, they're tiny. Their budgets are all like one to two million dollars a year. Nobody knows this. You know, we give away, Americans give away 300 billion dollars to charity every single year. And what we have as an infrastructure for measuring the impact of that is seven or eight million dollars in combined budgets. 
and they look at five, 6,000 organizations, there are 1.5 million charities in America. We need something robust. It's gonna cost on the order of half a billion dollars to gather that data on an annual basis and distribute it to Americans in a user-friendly way and keep it updated. And some people say, well, that's ridiculous, a half a billion dollars. No, what's ridiculous is to not spend half a billion dollars to measure $300 billion worth of annual philanthropy. You know, we were talking about decadence earlier. That's decadence, you know, for America to give away $300 billion a year and have no idea what impact it's having. Mm. One of the things I'd like to mention on this, because we talk about this a lot at AEI, um, given the fact that corporate responsibility is an important part of capitalism, social responsibility on the part of an organization like AEI is an important part of the free enterprise aspects of what we do. We believe in markets for us too. And we have a, a, a relatively detailed uh, scorecard that we put together where we understand uh, inputs, processes, outputs, and impacts. And we put together a prospectus when we're going to a major funder with a big new project saying this is what we're gonna measure. And then when we go back with the, the, the report to our funders and say, here's how we did. Here's actually how we used the inputs. Here's what we did with it in terms of process. Here's how much stuff we got out, which was output. And here's the impact that it has with a relatively sophisticated set of proxy measures. And it's been enormously helpful, not just for our donors to be able to justify to their boards of directors, et cetera, to, to fund the American Enterprise Institute. It's been enormously important for us to become a more effective organization, and we're trying to proliferate a lot of these ideas as well. If we could do it on a national scale, like Dan says, imagine. Imagine, you know, $300 billion, man, that's a drop in the bucket compared to American philanthropy, what American philanthropy could be, the potential of that. If we could unleash that because there was that much more confidence about the social good that was going on, you know, what could we double that? What could we make it a... Can we get a trillion dollars a year? Why not in an economy that, that, I mean, that's just, a, it's a tiny slice of the American economy still. But you have to give people confidence, and, and this is, in point of fact, the way that it gets done. And that's the big play. You know, the big play is what, it, what if we could move charitable giving from 2% of GDP to 3% or 3.5% of GDP? That would be a transformation of the culture right. and a transformation of the impact our organizations are able to have. You know, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the nonprofit sector, and some people will dumb down my argument and say, oh, Dan Pilati, he's the guy who thinks charity should act more like business. No, no, no. What I'm saying is we as a culture are not for a moment ready to give charities the big league freedoms we really give to business. So please stop telling charities to act more like business as if they're too stupid to do it. If they weren't going to get thrown in jail or have their reputations dragged through the mud for doing it, they would take the best pieces of business. And then their potential could be unleashed. And you would, you would see suicide rates going down. And you would see adult illiteracy improving because they would be some order of magnitude of the size of the problem that could actually make a difference. Hmm. Let's close the session by bringing it back to the key, the, the way that we opened it, which is... Um, the idea of human potential based on the concept of solidarity and, and love that we have in our society. If we got to three or three and a half percent of GDP that people were giving away, that's great for AEI. That's great for nonprofits. It's great for our ability to do all these important things. But who does it really benefit? It benefits the people who are giving because it's the expression of love that benefits the lover, him or herself. And wouldn't that be a better country 10 years from now? These are the concepts that Dan Pilata is bringing to the, to the discussion in the nonprofit sector, and, and we're grateful to him for bringing them to AEI today. Please join me in thanking Dan Pilata. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, man. Nice job. Thanks, Dan. Right uh, Dan is going to record a podcast for us now, so look for that. You'll be, we'll be picking up the discussion where we left it here on the podcast, and you'll be able to listen to it over and over again and show all your friends why this was a nice session today. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day.